All right, so starting with number one, um, we have a function x squared minus 6x over x plus 2. Okay, does Rolle's theorem apply on the interval from 0 to 6? Find the value of c defined by Rolle's theorem. So the whole purpose of Rolle's theorem is to see, is there a location between zero and six where we can guarantee um, that there is going to be a slope zero somewhere along the curve? Um, but if we want to guarantee slope, um, in this case, slope zero, uh, we have to confirm that, that there's no slope issues uh, and uh, no continuity issues uh, for the entirety of our uh, domain or interval, um, but uh, there is a bit of a red flag with this function, and we have a variable in the denominator, which we got to pay attention to because this could cause an issue for our problem. So if I look at that denominator x plus two, that's usually where I can find vertical asymptotes or holes. So if I set that x plus two equal to zero, I get x equals negative two. And that tells us that there's a vertical asymptote at x equals negative two. It doesn't automatically mean that we have an issue, but it does. Uh, it, doesn't, it is something we have to be aware of. Uh, the question is, is this vertical asymptote going to disrupt my interval from zero to six? All right, it's not going to disrupt, so we're OK. Uh, we can continue with our conditions. Um, and um, typically right now, if you can make it past the first condition, it will also pass second condition. There are some exceptions, but you're not going to see that on the quiz. Okay, so we're safe. Um, our conditions now, if the vertical asymptote was like two or three or four, then there's an issue. And if there's any disruptions with our interval, we just say that our function is not continuous on the closed interval and we stop the problem. We say Rolle's theorem doesn't apply. If we if we can't make it past, past the first condition, we don't have a theorem to, to prove. Okay, but this one is safe. We spend the time to write out our conditions. On the key, I did not uh, specify the difference, but we have to make sure we understand. Continuity is with um, brackets. And differentiability is with parentheses. Okay. There's one more condition that's required, and, and that's come from the endpoints. Okay. So whether it's Rolle's theorem or mean value theorem, we're always going to take the time to find the order pairs at the endpoints. Okay. okay, so zero in for X, I get zero minus zero over two, zero over two is zero. <clears throat> Enter six into the function. Six squared is 36. 36 minus six times six is also 36. 36 over eight. Sorry, 36 minus 36 is zero. Zero over eight is still zero. So the important thing here is that uh, we do need to share the same y value, okay? If we want this to be a Rolle's theorem. Okay. And because they share the same y value, the slope is going to be zero, and that's what we were after. Okay, so whatever the graph looks like, we know the endpoints share the same Y value. That means we can draw a horizontal line between the two order pairs, which means that somewhere along the curve, there must be at least another location where the slope is zero. So the graph may look something like this, where you get zero, zero and six, zero. And because you can draw a horizontal line between the two, you know that there must be at least another point where there's going to be a slope zero. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for that location where the graph is going to experience 
a slope zero. OK, so now that we have all three conditions passing, we know Rolle's theorem will apply. Now we're just going to go and look for that location. OK, so um, now we can move on to our derivative. F prime. Now the way that this problem is set up, there's a numerator and denominator. We have to go through quotient rule. F prime times G minus F times G prime all over G squared. Expand everything out. Careful not to do this, right? We can't take the X plus twos out. That minus is preventing us from doing that. We have to spend the time to foil and expand the numerator out. So now that we have our derivative, we have to, um, we're basically are looking for the location where a specific slope occurs. And we know with Rolle's theorem, it's always going to be slope zero. So we're going to take this slope zero, we're going to put it in for this F prime slot. Now, because we're looking for slope zero, uh, we're just going to focus on the numerator. Because if we set the denominator equal to zero, that's something else. That, that means we're looking for a slope undefined. We don't want that. We want to look for slope zero. So we're just going to set the numerator equal to zero. This is factorable here. Multiply to be negative 12, add it to be 4. Six and negative two. Okay, we get negative six and two. Um, but anytime we, we find a, a location, we always have to go back and consider our interval. Right? We only care about location that's inside the interval. So which one do we remove? Which one is not part of our interval? Negative yeah, negative six, right? Negative six is obviously not between zero and six. Uh, we're guaranteed at least one location. Okay, so if you find both locations outside the interval, there's an issue, right? We're guaranteed that there's at least one location, and um, and two is the one that fulfills that. Any questions with one? <clears> hey, <throat> okay, number two. Uh, determine uh, whether mean valid theorem can be applied for the function x plus one over x on the interval from one half to two. And we want to go through a mean value theorem. Okay, so here's number two.
again, there's a bit of a red flag here uh, with that denominator uh, because there's a denominator variable. We have to consider the fact that um, there is going to be a break, but we want to know if that break you know, doesn't mean that it's automatically going to impact our problem, but we at least want to consider it. So the denominator, uh, whatever makes the denominator zero is going to be either a whole or vertical asymptote. In this case, it's a vertical asymptote. If the only break in the graph is outside the interval, we're safe. But if this disrupts our interval, then we have a, we have an issue. But zero is safely outside of this interval, so we're safe. There's that break is not going to impact my interval. My interval is going to be continuous um, and differentiable. So. Continuity is with brackets, differentiability is with parentheses. Okay, next up, uh, just like with Rolle's theorem, we're also going to insert the order pairs or insert the X values into the original function, right? Um, okay, so uh, we'll plug one half and two into the original function. Make sure that we always do this because I think the tendency is sometimes I see students, they find the derivative too soon and they end up inserting the X values into the derivative, which we do not want. OK, we want to um, stay with the function and you find order pairs at the function level, not at the derivative level. Okay, we have our order pairs, one half three and two three halves. The, the main difference with mean value theorem and Rolle's theorem is that with Rolle's theorem, we do need the order pairs to share the same y value so that we can create a slope zero because that's what Rolle's theorem needs. It needs slope zero, but mean value theorem can be any y value, okay? Because the slope doesn't have to be zero. The slope can be any slope as long as um, it's valid. So now we take the time to find the slope. Change in Y over change in X. Okay, so three halves minus three is negative three halves. 2 minus 1 half is 3 halves. Negative 3 halves over 3 halves is negative 1. So now we can find F prime. And if you look, F prime requires quotient rule. Okay, we'll do some cleanup. So 
So now I have my derivative. I know the slope that I want to target. So I'm going to take that slope, insert it into the derivative slot. And I'm solve for X. I can, if I solve for X, I can find the location on this curve where a, a specific negative one slope that I want to guarantee is going to occur. If I cross multiply here, by both sides by negative one, take the square root. Notice there's a plus or minus that shows up. Anytime I see two solutions, I always want to consider the fact that there may be one that's outside the interval. So it doesn't, it's possible that both are inside interval, but we have to be careful here. And um, do we keep both of these? Okay, which one is removed? Negative one, yeah, because we're only, we only want a, a, a X value that's between the interval. Endpoints is not good enough, it's gotta be between. So negative one is outside the interval, only one. That's our C equals one. So if you feel like there is a lot of similarity between Rolle's theorem and mean value theorem, uh, you're right. They're basically the same theorem. It's just that Rolle's theorem is a bit more restrictive. It needs the order pairs to be the exact same y value, um, but the process is identical. Mean value theorem order pairs don't have to share the same y value, but mean value theorem it does. But other, other than that, if you if you feel like you're doing the exact same thing, it's because they're both under um, mean value theorem. Rolle's theorem is just a more specific version of mean value theorem. Okay, any questions with one or two? Okay, there's number three. Uh, number three says use the second derivative test to classify the critical points. Y equals one fourth x to the fourth minus two x cubed plus six. Okay, so uh, second derivative test does the same um, job as the first derivative test. They both are going to help you find relative max and relative min. Um, and um, 
our in our initial steps will feel the same as the first derivative test. We're still going to find f prime. We're still going to set f prime to go to zero. We're still going to find our critical points, but from there our paths will will, will will be different. With first derivative tests, you're going to create a slope sign line and actually test the intervals and look at the slope um, behavior. With the second derivative test, we're going to get to the second derivative function and insert the critical points from f prime into the second derivative function and use that to help us determine whether the points are relative max or relative min. Okay. So let's find f prime. <clears throat> With the power rule. So from here we can ask uh, uh, factor. Solve for X set equal to zero. Okay, so these are the critical points that we are going to be making this decision on. Um, now we could, with the first derivative test, we would do this. We would find f prime, we would test zero and six, and we'll test the signs, right? Whether it's positive slope or negative slope, and then go from there, right? That's first derivative test, but we're not going to go down this path. We're going to go down a different path for um, first for second derivative test. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to find F double prime. And involve these critical points. OK. So F double prime, we go through the power rule again. X cubed becomes X squared. Minus. 12 X. OK. Now, we don't want to set the second derivative equal to zero. That's something else. That's test for concavity. Um, we want to involve these critical points into the second derivative function. <clears throat> okay, F double prime of zero equals three times zero squared minus 12 times zero which is zero. Now zero is neither concave up nor concave down. We haven't talked about this, but this is where it's inconclusive. This is not a good test. For determining whether we have relative max relative min. OK, so you won't see this on the quiz. It'll be more straightforward. Let's look at the other point here. F double prime of six. Okay, enter six and for X. This ends up being 108 minus 72, which is 36. The number is not that important. It's the fact that it's what? Say that again? Greater than zero. Yep, that's what's important. All right. And greater than zero, we have to verbalize it uh, with something that's, that's, what does that mean? Second derivative positive value means what? The graph is what? Concave what? Up. And if you can visualize what concave up looks like, this is what concave up looks like. Then you can make a decision, right? I, I have a slope zero intersecting with a concave up. I must be looking at a what? Relative minimum. So I, my conclusion is there's a relative minimum. At X equals six. Now we don't want to do this. We don't want to say 
there's a relative minimum at six comma thirty six. Why is that? Yeah, this thirty six is the is the concavity value. It's not the order pair. If you want to find the order pair, you got to go back to the what? No, original function. I right, gotta go back to the original function. Remember, your original function is gonna give you the physical location of the function. If I only ask you for the x value, you can just give me that x equals six. Okay. Again, a lot of students um, struggle with not struggle, but um, they they get it flipped around because they see a positive number and they want to assume that positive means bigger, and so they want to say relative max. Especially when they see a negative number. A negative number, it feels like a smaller number, so you want to say relative minimum. Yeah, anytime you get a zero, that indicates that uh, we don't know what's going on there. I mean, it could be a relative max, it could be a relative min, it could be neither. We'll have to go through the first derivative test to help us conclude that uh, on the quiz, you're going to see a, a positive or a negative value. Let me do a variation of number three. I'll call this 3B here. <laughs> So let's say um, I gave you a function value here. F of two is equal to nine. F prime of two is equal to zero. And F double prime of two is equal to negative 16. Okay, let's see what uh, conclusion that we can make about this X equals two. We know that's just an order pair, some point that lives on the graph. Uh, what do you know about that point? This point is going to have a slope what? Slope zero. And what is that negative 16 from the second derivative going to tell us? Less than zero means concave down. So if I have an order pair where the slope is zero and the graph is part of a concave down graph, what conclusion can we make? This point must be a what? Absolutely. Uh, relative max, yeah. Order pair is two nine, slope is zero, concave down. We can reach that conclusion relative maximum at order pair two nine. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, for the previous one, you said not to do a point, um, but you did a. What's the difference between those two? Uh, if I I don't want to choose thirty six because thirty six is not coming from the original function. If I want to find the order pair, I'll have to plug six into the original function and get whatever the y value is pulling from here. But here for part B, the order pair is two nine, so we can safely say the order pair is two nine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see some students do this where they 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 consider this as a location, but it's not. That's just concavity, and the number is not that important. You just know that oh, it's part of the concave down graph, just a different variation of concavity. OK, all right, let's look at number four. Okay, number four says uh, sketch a labeled graph with the following characteristics. I'll go ahead and write those out, make it easier to read.
OK, uh, order pairs, negative one, four and two, negative one. I can go ahead and um, put that onto a graph. Order pair two, negative one. Also, there's an order pair here. Point of inflection is at one, two. I can go ahead and put that down as well. Okay, uh, I like to create a slope and concavity sign line as a, a bridge uh, between the statements and the graph that I eventually want to fill out. Um, part B says F prime of X is greater than zero. When X is less than negative one and X is greater than two. What's another way of saying F prime of X is greater than zero? Yeah, so positive slope to the left of negative one and to the right of two. So that negative one and two is helpful. It kind of tells you where the critical points are. So those are numbers that you want to you want to you want showing up on your slope sign line. Positive slope. To the left of negative one and to the right of two. Okay, F prime of X is less than zero. How do you say that? That means slope is negative between negative one and two. So those arrows are kind of helping us, giving us an idea how the shape of the graph is going to um, is going to come out. Uh, part D, point of inflection at 1, 2. So we know that is um, going to automatically be a critical point on the second derivative function. Focus on the X value of 1. We know there's going to be a change in signs on either side. And here is extra confirmation. Second derivative is less than 0. Concave what? Down to the left of 1. And then concave up to the right of 1. Okay, so what I like to do is I like to break this up into two steps. I like to um, use the slope sign line just to kind of give me a path of the graph without any of the curvature. And then once I have the, the path laid out, then I'll go back along that path and I will give it the curvature. That way you're not feeling like you're trying to do too many things at once. Uh, you kind of trace over it twice. Um, and also, this is going to help keep you in line because sometimes if you just look at the curvature, you may be doing too much um, when when it's not part of uh, the path of the graph. So I know I want a relative maximum at negative one. I know I want a relative minimum at two. So I'm just going to kind of go through and um, go through that process, right? So I'm going to have a relative maximum at negative one a relative minimum at two. So I don't really care about the curvature right now. I just want to just want to get my path laid out. I know that once I go back and give it the curvature, I'm not going to veer too far away from this path. But I just want the slope to be correct. Positive slope, negative slope, positive slope. OK, so now I go back and I trace over this. I want a concave down or this portion of the graph. There's going to be a point of flexion at one, so there's going to be a transition point where there's going to be a sudden switch to a concave up graph. So here's my concave up. We'll pick up where I left off here. And whatever you do with your trace, it should not veer too far away from your dotted line, right? Your dotted line is going to help keep you in check. So you're not going off, um, you know, off track. But looking at the second derivative function will kind of give you that curvature that you need to, um, uh, to give it the shape that the graph is looking for. Okay, number 
Okay, number five is um, Extreme Valley Theorem problem check. Five says find the absolute max and absolute min of a function given by f of x on the interval from negative four to four. Uh, I'm looking at the denominator thinking, OK, um, there is only one condition for uh, EVT and I do need continuity. Um, but if, if I see a variable in the denominator, I have to at least consider the fact that there may be an issue. But if I set x squared plus 4 equal to 0 and I try to solve for x, I'm not going to get anything. right? I'm not going to get any real numbers, so um, we're safe. The denominator is not going to produce any x value that will have any disruptions because I don't have anything that can cause my denominator to be zero. So um, our uh, theorem is extreme value theorem, and our condition is that the function is continuous on a closed interval, and it is. There is nothing that can cause my function to be undefined. There is no differentiable statement for EVT. We can't have sharp turns for EVT, but we can't have any sharp turns for uh, Rolls theorem or mean value theorem. Okay, so now we have to go to our derivative because our derivative is going to help us find our critical values. Our critical values are going to be um, candidates for max and min. Okay, so let's find f prime. F prime, we have to go through quotient rule again. We have a new random denominator here. Again, we can't do this, right? We can never cancel numerator and denominator out with quotient rule. That minus is always preventing us from doing that. So we got to expand, distribute everything through. Uh, combine some like terms in the numerator. 2x cubed goes away. 8x plus 8x is 16x. Okay, so once you have your derivative, you're going to set your numerator and your denominator equal to zero. Um, so the numerator is going to give us 16x equals zero. The denominator. We're going to run into the same issue in the denominator here. There's nothing that we can do with X. If we solve for X, we're going to get imaginary number, and that's not a part of our real number system. So there's nothing that we can find in the denominator. For the numerator, we can find X equals what? Zero. Now, how do we know whether this critical point is valid or not? Good. It needs to be between. If it's outside the interval, it's not part of our problem. Zero is a candidate, so we're going to test zero negative four and four. There's nothing that came from the denominator, no real number that we can find. So we only have three numbers to test. And out of those three numbers, we're going to determine what's the absolute max and what's the absolute min on this graph between negative four and four. Okay. So they all go into the original function.
plug it zero. Plug in four. Okay, we only care about the y value here. So absolute max is three fifths, because that's the higher of the two, and the lowest value is negative one. You don't have to write any because statements. Um, if you identify the theorem, state the condition, find your critical value, and then you test all the uh, candidates as well as the endpoints, that's your justification. So on this quiz review, I, I wanted to tackle um, the problems that um, that are more difficult. So we did uh, an example of extreme valley theorem. We did Rolle's theorem. We did mean valley theorem. We did second order test. We did a sketch of the graph. Um, what I left off were are the easier ones, and we can go back and do some of those. So on your worksheet three, on page ten. You're also going to see problems like this, but these are ones that students find easier. Um, uh, using the uh, going through first derivative test, so you'll find f prime, set f prime equal to zero. Um, find your critical points, populate your slope sine line, uh, test values you need subintervals, and then write out all your statements. Interval increasing, interval decreasing, relative max, relative min, and write out writing out all your because statements. Okay, to try that, I can go over the answer here. So f prime, uh, we just go through power rule. Um, from there, we set f prime equal to zero. Factor out uh, GCF. Continue factoring. I get negative one and two. That will go onto my slope sine line. I chose values that are, I think, the easiest to plug in. Uh, so I'll choose to the left of negative two. I'll choose negative three. Two negative two and one. I'll choose zero. And to the right of one, I'll choose two. They call. They all. Uh, get inserted into the factor form of the derivative. And I just care about whether um, each interval will give me a positive or negative value. If I insert negative three, um, I'll get uh, a negative times a negative, which is positive. So I put an up arrow there. If I test zero, I get zero plus two times zero minus one. That's negative. And if I test to the Right of one, I can plug two in. I get positive times positive, which is positive. So from here, yes. When you start getting relative max and relative min, you plug it into the derivative. No, into the derivative function. Yeah. 
Now, once you can confirm that's a relative max or relative min, and you're ready to find order pairs, then you can insert back into the original function to get that physical point. But in your in your uh, slope sign line, your test points will go into the derivative, not into the original. If you plug into the original, it'll give you location, but it's not going to give you the slope behavior that that, that you care about. Now, yes. So why'd you write negative seven? Oh, um, so I confirmed that relative minimum is at one because the slope went from decrease to increase, right? I know there's relative min. If I plug one into the derivative, I should get zero because that is a slope zero. But relative minimum is a physical point. So I'm going to insert one into the original function. That will give me a negative seven. All right, so are you, do you agree that F prime of one is different than F of one? Yeah. So f prime of one indicates that it's a slope zero, which we found. That's why it goes. That, that's, that's why I went here onto my slope sign line. But once I confirm that that is a relative minimum, and I'm looking for a physical location, then I'm ready to insert one into the original function. That way, it's a point that I can plot onto the graph. So if it's a negative, it's a positive. Uh, I mean, it, it can be a positive. It just depends on on where it lives on the graph, right? So if I plug negative seven into the original functions, it's going to give me a physical location on the graph. And if I were to graph it, one negative seven just happens to be down here. Negative two twenty happens to be up here. So if I were to physically graph it, it ends up at negative seven. It could be anywhere. It just depends on whatever the function tells you. I'm just saying, like, how do you know? How would you know if it's a relative minimum or not a relative max? Okay. The way you know is you look at the arrows. Because the arrows kind of help you map out how the graph is going to look, right? The graph is going to experience a positive slope, hit a slope of zero, decreases, hit a slope of zero, and increase. And by the shape of the graph, I know that at one, there must be a relative minimum because my graph is going to be decreasing followed by increase. That's how I know there's relative. So the arrows I find to be helpful because it kind of helps me visualize how the graph is rising and falling. And pay attention to the because statements because I will be um, requiring them on the quiz. A lot of students leave these out and they end up losing points. So make sure that you are spending time to write out those because statements. Yeah, any questions with this one? I hope you guys find this to be one of the easier ones, but if you're if there's any questions, I want to make sure that um, do I have to include the y values in the line of the fraction if I just said relative max? Uh, it depends on the instructions. If the instruction just says x value, then you provide x value. But if they ask you for the order pairs, then you would insert into the original function. Just use your calculator and whatever the y value gives you. Okay, number five is a similar process. It's just that um, if you're asked, if I'm asking for concave down, concave up points of inflection, you're going to work your way down to the second derivative function and then create your sign line and then gather all your information. So here's number five. Are we good with four? I'm sorry, this is um, back of worksheet three here. So f of x, find that prime, find that double prime. Uh, all your concave down, concave up, flex inflection is going to come from the second derivative function. So if that equal to zero, Factor a GCF out, solve for x, place all your critical points onto your concavity sign line, your second derivative sign line, and then uh, test your interval. So I, I'm going to test negative one, I'll test one, I'll test four. Uh, anytime I'm testing points on this, a sign line, they all go into um, that derivative level. 
So negative one into the second derivative, I'll get a positive followed by negative, so therefore negative. Plug one here, I'll get a positive followed by a negative, that's also negative. If I plug in four, I get a positive and a positive, which is positive. Now, how many points of questions are we going to have here? Two. It looks like only one. Why is that? There's only one change, There's only one, one change in direction, right? So zero is a candidate, but it didn't pass the test because it did not experience a change in sign. If there's no change in signs, it's not going to be a point of inflection. There has to be a change in sign. The order of, of sign change not, is not important. It could be from negative to positive or from positive to negative, but it needs to be a change in sign. If, there, if, there, if there's no change in sign, that is not a point of inflection. Concave down, we have two intervals of concave down. We have one interval of concave up. And then of course, you're paying attention to all your because statements and looking for all the because statements as well. Uh, so this was number three um, on the morning review. Uh, with the second derivative test, what you first do is you find that prime, and you set that prime equal to zero, and you're going to approach it like as if you're going to the first derivative test. Um, so you find that prime set equal to zero, but rather than putting the, the values into the second into the first derivative function and creating your slope sign line, you're going to insert these values into the second derivative function. So um, I'm going to make my way down to the second derivative function, 3x squared minus 12x. I'm going to insert um, 0 and 6. If I insert 6 in, I'm going to get a positive value. And if I get a positive value, that's going to indicate to me that a positive second derivative, I'm going to verbalize it, it means concave up. The concave up looks like this. And if you can draw a concave up, You'll be able to convince yourself that you're staring at a relative value. And if it's a negative value, if it's concave down, if it's concave down, draw a shape of it, it must be relative value. Yeah. Yeah. 